Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It always has been and always will be. The Torah proper instructed the people of Israel to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. This is where Shomer Mitzvot begins, by loving Hashem and accepting Him on His terms. By this, I mean accepting His means of covenant obedience. For today, this means acceptance of Yeshua, His only Son, for Jew and non-Jew alike. Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 155. My name is Ariel Ben-Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avino Malkin, our Father, our King. Lord, here we are in the middle of your special days, your holidays, your holy days, your Mikra e Kodesh, your holy convocations. You have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, and you're bringing us to a place where we can appreciate and understand the significance of how our Messiah, Yeshua, walked into these festivals and gave them their fullest significance, their fullest reality. We see this most clearly in the festivals of the fall feasts, I'm sorry, of the uh, the spring feasts, the ones that Yeshua has already um, fulfilled at his first coming. And now, even though we're in the middle of the fall feast, Lord, and we haven't seen the fullest expression of these on a corporate level, nevertheless, we believe that they are relevant and that we should participate in them so that we can keep an eye towards what the Father is doing through the body of Messiah in regards to his Son. We believe that the fall feast are still relevant in the life of Messiah, and we pray that uh, we'll continue to be in a place where we can um, recognize him as the preeminent one, um, for indeed without him there really isn't any significance to the festivals. So help us keep our uh, Messiah at the forefront of our festivals, um, keep us centered and focused on him, keep us filled with the Spirit, help us to be forgiving of one another, loving of one another and sharing messianic sympathy towards one another, praying for one another, building one another up, and keeping one another strong during these difficult times that we live in. Continue to protect us, and give us a voice, and give us clarity of thought. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you the praise and glory of Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Just want to thank everyone for joining me week after week. These are the live internet studies brought to you via... Uh, the internet, uh, live from South Korea. My name is Aura Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm a Torah teacher at Congregation Kehilad Nunava, the, Hor- the Harvest Congregation in Thornton, Colorado. As you can see on my screen right now, we are meeting live in person and we meet online uh, for YouTube videos. So if you can't join us uh, t- at our live service, then feel free to join us online. Um, go to grafted.com and click on the um, link that you can see on my screen where it says recent sermons and catch Pastor Mark's sermons that are uploaded there. Also, I've got my own website at tetetora.com. That's spelled T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. And I'd love to have you visit my home website. Click around through all the commentary links that you see there. And let me know what you like. If there's something that I don't discuss in one of my um, commentary sets, um, send me an email. Go all the way to the bottom of my um, website there, and there's a little icon that looks like an envelope. You can send me an email and let me know what you'd like to see, and I'll see what I can put together by way of uh, content. I also have a YouTube channel that you can find me online on YouTube's um platform youtube.com forward slash c for the word channel forward slash tete tour ministries and um i'd be delighted if you would visit me at my youtube channel and look at all the videos that i put together i'm pretty busy i try to upload something daily as you can see from uh the screen uh the thumbnails there if you do hit my um youtube channel make sure you do these few things for me subscribe hit the bell um leave a thumbs up um, leave comments 
and uh, share the content with your friends and family member, and that would be great. These live internet studies are brought to you week after week. Let me give you some uh, brief announcements that we're going to be looking at for tonight's program. This is episode number 155. Meeting date is September 18th, 2021, and that's the USA date. We meet Saturday afternoons from 5 p.m. to approximately 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you can join us, just set your clock against that particular uh, time zone. We meet for an hour, and there's two segments. The first 30-minute segment is dedicated to Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food, Oh My, Part 71. And we're just finishing up talking about um, a part of the food aspects and uh, table fellowship and how we can... Um, bake for mutual upbuilding uh, and and things like that in, in our local congregations. Segment two is given over to the um, apologetic study known as Exploring the Shema Discussions on the Issues of Trinity. We're in paper three, Who or What is the Holy Spirit, part 88. And I've got two uh, featured YouTube videos tonight. I've got to play a little bit of catch-up since we missed last week. Uh, one of the videos is on the lives, uh, SQSA live series study, Should Christians Observe the Day of Atonement, since we just came out of Yom Kippur. And the second one uh, looks forward to uh, what is the Feast of Tabernacles, since by the time of this recording, it's right around the corner, but by the time it gets uploaded to the video, we'll kind of be right in the middle of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Just briefly, again, these studies are brought to you live via Skype. Um, the easiest way to join us, if it is on a Saturday late afternoon and you're watching this video or uh, listening to this podcast and um, the study is going to be uh, happening, go to my website at tatesatour.com and click on the yellow banner at the very, very top that you can see right now where it says Live Internet Studies and that'll bring you to the Live Internet Studies page like you see and then just scroll down into the page until you see the blue Skype banner. Click that link and it'll join you to the study right there on the spot. We'd love to have you join us live. There's a, a afterwards, after doing the live study, I um, shut off the um, recorder and we just share with one another uh, personally, uh, pray for one another, or just you know laugh and cry together, whatever is on our mind. And it's made exclusively to the live group. So uh, if, if it's a type of fellowship that you'd like to join in, well then, um, that's available through the live Skype study. And then one last thing real quick, if you are on my website at tatetor.com, take a moment to scroll all the way to the very bottom to that black section where you can see some Hebrew writing and carefully consider donating to my ministry. There's a little yellow donate button that you can see right there. Um, as I mentioned uh, in each show, I'm still in a place where I'm relying on the gifts and donations of others to kind of keep me going and uh, God is just working miraculously through the the generosity of others so uh, I want to first and foremost say thank you to all of those people out there who have given sacrificially to help me uh, uh, just make it from month to month and uh, I'm believing by faith that God is uh, using uh, your gifts and generosity to, to help me uh, keep going I don't understand how that works he's God he could just snap his fingers and you know, a million dollars could drop into my lap. But, you know, he doesn't work that way. He chooses to partner with um, people like you. And so um, I pray that uh, God will continue to bless you and raise you up uh, as you continue to partner with ministries like mine. So as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. All right, let's turn to Romans 14 Unplugged, Feasts and Fast and Food, Oh My. And um, I made some organizational changes to the commentary to make it a little easier not just for me to navigate around through the web page but easier for you since it's you know somewhat of a lengthy study and a good number of my YouTube uh, viewers are using their smartphones or something like that to um, log on to my website and follow along so I'm, I added a bunch of organizational links so if you go to my website now to tatesator.com and click on the Romans 14 study let me just bump up the uh, font um, if you go to the study what you're gonna find when you uh, begin to look at it is I've added a table of contents section and each one of those uh, topic numbers if you can see them on my screen right now um, if I scroll down there's what is that? 18 of them. Um, each one of those topical sections is a paragraph heading, and now they're all hot links. So if I, for instance, I could jump right over to number four, who are the weak? It takes me right down into the study. 
And um, and then if you scroll up a little bit, or if you were to like say read down through that particular study, you get finished with it. You can see there's a little link that says Return to Table of Contents. If you click that, it takes you all the way back up to the top, so you can pick a different topic. And this way, it's easier to jump around a little bit. It's also easier to um, jump in right where I'm going. So for instance, for myself, uh, we're going to jump all the way down. We're going to scroll all the way down to um, how can we make for peace and mutual building point number 15. So if I click the link, then bingo, we're right where I need to be. A lot easier for me. And if I want to jump up back up to table of contents, I can do so. And the same navigational um, uh, links are available in the PDF version. If you were to click that and open up the PDF version online, um, the paragraph headings have links to them. The table of contents is hot linked. So it, I don't think it has to return to table contents, but at least you can jump down through the, uh, the chapters, breaks down and things like that. So we're in verse um, 19 of chapter 14. We're looking at this topic of Paul's challenging, and really, as I understand it, this is the heart of this particular chapter. Paul is challenging the Jews and Gentiles uh, within his readership to carefully consider and understand the important role that they play with one another, um, that they play, uh, that that they have in the plans of God going forward as Jews and Gentiles. God doesn't want Gentiles to forget about Jews, nor does he want Jews to forget about Gentiles. He doesn't want the two groups to just mow over one another in an effort to try and somehow make the church program go forward. Um, the verse reads, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Paul's not interested in, in creating some sort of community between the body of Messiah and the pagan world around him. That's not the mutual upbuilding that he's concerned about. No, to be sure, Paul addresses most of his letters to brothers, which on its most normative understanding would have been the smaller a group of Gentile brotherhood, Gentile Christians around the, the world that Paul was writing to. Um, that's what he means by brothers, but includes Jews. It's just that by this point in time, um, Paul understands that Gentiles are, are, are largely outnumbering the, the Jewish population when it comes to how many people are in the body of Messiah. The, the Gentiles are being brought in mass, which is fine by Paul. It's part of God's salvation program. But at the same time, I believe that, and we're going to read about this tonight, Paul has this overarching kind of umbrella faith community that he had initially belonged to before he became a Messianic Jew himself. I'm speaking of the covenant community of Israel, God's family group. Remember, Abrahamic faith extends to Gentiles, but it started with um, uh, sons of Jacob first, Abraham's uh, uh, immediate family, the Jewish people, uh, Israel of which Paul is still a part. So he wants Gentile Christians, the smaller brotherhood group, to understand where they fit within the larger family of faith, even though present-day Israel in Paul's day and to our day as well, even though Israel is in a present state of stumbling and blindness. She's, she can't understand how Yeshua fits into her salvation program. She certainly can't understand how Gentiles fit in either. So she's blinded to that part of the gospel, what Paul calls the mystery of the gospel in the book of Ephesians, the, the inclusion of the Gentiles into um, God's salvation program. Read Romans chapters 9 through 11 very carefully and see how Paul... Um, explains this all of tree theology of Jews and Gentiles being brought together and overlap that um, reading of Romans with Ephesians chapters 2 through the rest of the, ch of the book there, uh, really the whole book of Ephesians. Um, and you'll see how um, Paul is trying to get Jews and Gentiles to work their issues out. That's what he means by uh, peace and mutual uh, building. Let's just read the Greek since we have it over there on the page for us. Sorry, I have to keep muting my microphone and coughing there. Um, SPL GNT version of verse 19 says, Ara un tates erenes diokomen kai tates oikadames tes eis alelus. All right, let's look at the notes. I updated uh, some of these as well from the last time that we saw this, uh, from last week even. And since we missed a whole week, I had a chance to kind of uh, rework some of this and offer some more information. But um, we read this section by way of Mark Nano's contribution to 
Paul's uh, letter to the book of Romans here, the commentary on it. And um, Mark Nanos reminds us that um, Paul's working from the understanding that Jews would have been uh, rebuilding their communities after the expulsion from Rome, uh, no matter how big or small you factor in the expulsion, it still did happen, and Jews did have to leave. We don't know how many exactly left, but nevertheless, Paul realizes that the Gentiles who were there in Rome needed to stay in some sort of communicative um, community with the synagogue communities, even if they were small, they were certainly decimated at some level, but nevertheless, Paul knows that he's writing to Jews and Gentiles, and he also knows that um, even though Israel is going to be questioning the identity of Messiah, God's Holy Spirit is still working among the Jewish synagogues, the Jewish communities, to bring them in a place of where their darkness uh, and the blindness is being lifted. In other words, to say it a different way, Paul does not believe that God has given up on Israel, and neither should you. And so, that's the challenge. So, Mark Nanos um, reminds us that um, Paul is writing to a group of um, community members. He knows that the majority are Gentiles, but he also expects the Gentiles to have um, an awareness of their Jewish counterparts. There are surely Jewish people in the, in the congregation. We don't know exactly how many, and it's likely that they're the minority. And it's also likely that the Jewish people are the group that Paul refers to as the weak. Now, <clears throat> Just because Paul refers to them as weak, it's not a place where I believe Paul wants the Gentile Christians to understand their weakness to be tied to their Torah observance. Um, instead, Mark Nano suggests that the weakness is actually an indicator of their messianic status as Jews. They haven't embraced Messiah openly as the as the, the redeemer of Israel. They're uh, open to the idea there. They think it's uh, something that's worth looking into. They're investigating the, the idea. They're not hostile to the notion. They're searching their scriptures for um, the identity of Messiah. And it just it's going to take just a little nudge from the Gentile uh, evangelistic side of the house to bring those Gentiles over into uh, an, an acceptance of who Yeshua is. That's a workable thesis for the definition of weak, uh, weak in faith, the meaning weak in their faith towards Messiah, um, the 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 um the I was gonna say danger, but the um the uh, how do I want to describe this? If we describe weakness in terms of keeping Torah from a Gentile Christian perspective, like we like today, if you ask your average um, Bible student. Uh, with regards to Romans 14, who are the weak in faith, you're likely to receive an answer that um, the weak in faith are those Jewish Christians, to include any Gentile ones as well, but largely, predominantly, Jewish Christians, so Messianic Jews. It's predominantly those Messianic Jews who did count themselves as Christian in Paul's day, but they were still holding on to their Torah observance. And that, that preference for keeping Torah is what made them weak. It's because, from Paul's perspective, this is the popular Christian opinion that I'm describing. From Paul's perspective, the Torah has been done away with. The Torah has been set aside, it's been relaxed, it's been fulfilled in Jesus. And so, therefore, since we no longer have to keep the Torah as Gentile Christians, or as Messianic Jews, then to go back under the law is a position of going backwards. It's a sign of weakness. It's a sign that you're still not... Uh, enjoying the freedom in Christ, and you're not you're not embracing the the totality of being free in Messiah, uh, free from the law, and so that's the 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 overall um, interpretation of this part of Paul's letter from the Christian perspective, the historic popular opinion that you could pick up in uh, gather from uh, listening to sermons or reading commentaries or going online or um, you know attending a seminary or something like that. That's the position. Mark Nanos challenges that. I challenge that. Uh, Tim Haig challenges that. We're not the only three in the world, by the way. There are certainly others who do it. There's, we're just, I'm just naming a few off the top of my head. Uh, David Stern challenges that as well. 
um, a few other Messianic Jews or Messianic-oriented uh, type Jewish people that feel that that's a really a pejorative way of speaking of Torah observance. Um, and I think that most Hebraically oriented people group that people groups that are going to be listening to my commentary would agree. So let's read this part of my commentary real quick. Um, we're working our way towards um, the rest of this uh, commentary. Um, I let's see. Let me let me see where I left off. Um, yeah, I actually did leave off two weeks ago, right where it says the word spiritual, spiritually, spirituality. So I'm right where I need to be. So here's where we're picking up. We're we're kind of in the middle of um, uh, Mark Nanos's comments about Paul writing to Gentiles and Jews with the important idea that we need to work together, not by erasing Jewish identity or simply, um, um, uh, how would we say, voting out Torah observance, you know, like putting Torah observance to a vote, you know, raise your hand all in favor of keeping Sabbath, raise your hand all in favor of keeping kosher, raise your hand, that type of thing. And of course, if we have a majority of Gentiles, it's likely we might have a majority vote who says, we don't think we need to keep Torah, we don't think we need to keep Sabbath, we don't think we need to keep kosher, everything's clean. Let's just move on. You know that's the old era. It's 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 past. Um, it's been re- those people groups have been replaced. God's God's working with us now. If that were to take case, then we would erase Jewish distinctiveness in the community. And I don't think Paul would be happy with that. Here's what Nanos has to say. If these non-Jews attended Jewish communal meetings, they would hear the scriptures read, translated, and interpreted in sermons, a regular weekly event based on cycling through the Pentateuch, and texts linked to it from the prophets and other writings. We're talking about the weekly Torah portions that um, if you, um, you probably have to Google search this if you're not aware, weekly Torah portion and you'll find that the Jewish communities, religious communities around the world today still engage in reading a section of the five books of Moses, a few chapters at a time, to work their way through a one-year reading cycle so that you read through Gen- from Genesis through Deuteronomy in a year cycle. And, t- and on that note, by the time you watch this video, we, by the time I upload it, we will be cycling around to the end of, dis- of uh, Deuteronomy with the Parashat Vazot Bracha, these are the blessings. This is the blessing. Um, what's what? That's what Vazot Bracha uh, interpreted means. And it's the final portion of Deuteronomy. And um, we'll be poised to pick up our reading in Genesis again at the end of the last festival day, known as Simchat Torah, which is the eighth day of Sukkot, which is like I said, right around the middle of um, of uh, this month that we're in. So. I uh, hope you can join us, uh, this Torah community, for those own uh, Torah teachings. Let's see what Mark Nanos continues to uh, uh, challenge us with. He says, although we cannot be certain of the historical audience's relationship to the larger Jewish community, from the fact that many of his arguments require at least some familiarity with the Jewish community's master narratives, Paul's audience is approached throughout the letter as if familiar with many concepts that would be foreign to to non-Jews. And um, the point I'm trying to highlight by pulling this quote in from Nanos is that Paul's argumentation in the whole book of Romans, Paul's line of reasoning, draws heavily on a basic understanding of the Old Testament uh, theology and narratives and God's working with uh, Israel as a, as a people and the fact that God's bringing the Gentiles into this program, and the fact that Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, is the Messiah of the whole world. And he's the same Savior of the world. It's the same Savior to Israel. And that um, in order to understand uh, the Messianic message, one needs to have at least a base level of understanding and appreciation of the Tanakh. Otherwise, uh, the message of salvation is just going to go over your head. It's not going to really have any deep meaning uh, um, for you as a Gentile. So Paul's trying to get his uh, readership to also understand that to um, keep his arguments cohesive, you have to at least 
had some, say, exposure to the Jewish scriptures so that you can corroborate his quotes. Because Paul quotes from uh, the Old Testament over and over and over again to support his uh, understanding of who Jesus as the Messiah is. And unless you know your Tanakh as a Jew, or unless you have access to it as a Gentile at the synagogue level, you're not really going to be in a position where you think Paul's letter to Romans is going to be of any value or of any importance. It's just not really going to um, uh, make much sense to you if, if, if you don't really uh, understand where Paul's going. All right, let's keep reading through the, the commentary. These are my own um, re, uh, uh, notes here um, that I have uh, uh, that I'm looking at. By the And I'll just go like... Uh, line by line, let me see if I can go like that, by the revelation of the power of the risen Messiah within him, and by studying his Tanakh carefully and afresh with eyes opened by the Holy Spirit, Paul had come to the realization that the kingdom of God was much bigger than just native-born sons of Jacob. You understand what I mean there? He began to realize that there was a bigger plan at stake than just Israel. God was actually reaching out to the nations, and he was using Israel to do it. God was bringing the peoples of the surrounding nations into the family of Abraham and causing um, the family to uh, grow exponentially, even to the point by, by Paul's day, the family of Abraham had grown so large that Gentiles were outnumbering the Jewish people. And, God, and, and uh, um, Paul was fine with that, but he needed the Gentiles to understand that this growth did not signal uh, the end of Israel's um, involvement in uh, God's salvation history. I go on to say, God was bringing those from the nations uh, not just into a very special unity with his only unique son, but also into a practical working relationship with the people of Israel. The high moral standards of the kingdom of God would require that believing Jews and Gentiles, they need to put the, aside their quote-unquote petty differences over table fellowship, and they need to come together to pursue, and this is a quote from the verse in question, pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding, end quote. That's why Paul brings this in. He realizes that we need to get, we need each other. We need to understand that God has um, made it his plan to include Jews and Gentiles together in in the family of Abraham by faith in, in um, his son, Messiah Yeshua. I go on to say in my commentary, contrary to popular Christian opinions today, this does not, when I say this, I mean the, um, the, pursuant, uh, the pursuance of peace and mutual building and making the community strong, this does not require the setting aside of the ritual aspects of Torah um, such as the dietary laws of Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, so that, quote, everyone at, the, at their local church potluck can now have ham sandwiches with their crawdad gumbo and enjoy them without feeling ju judged, end quote. You understand what I'm, what I'm trying to um, uh, uh, get at there. Paul doesn't think that the mutual cohesion of the communities, that the building up of Jews and Gentiles together, is going to happen at the expense of setting aside the law of God, the law of Moses. And this is the unfortunate historical uh, perspective that the Gentile Christian Church inherited and passed along for the last 2,000 years or so. They have decided that the Jews are out, the Gentiles are in, the Old Testament's out, the New Testament's in, um, the Torah's out, the, we could say it this way, the law of Moses is out, the law of Christ is in, and um, the synagogue is out, the church is in. And so what we're describing is some form of replacement theology or supersessionism, the idea that God is replacing one people group with a new people group, and that, um, that he has given up um, basically on uh, uh, Israel as a people group. And so uh, I say it in my commentary this way, uh, hitting the reset button on Hashem's Sorry about that. Hitting the reset button on Hashem's standard of clean and unclean animals 
cannot be the solution that Paul is suggesting here in his letter. Nor, I say in my commentary, is he, adva- is he advocating a congregational superficiality in regards to accommodating other people's dietary scruples, right? All the while harboring disdain and resentment against the other, right, othering, quote-unquote, for making you, quote, go out of your way just to meet their special culinary needs, right? So you know how this feels. You attend a potluck, or you're the pastor who's who's uh, setting up a potluck, and you realize that there, uh, out of the majority of people, there's a few people who just don't agree with the, di- the choices of dishes that are being served, and so they make this special request. Can you make a special table for us where we've got our own special foods? And of course, on the, on the face of it, on the surface, uh, the pastor and the leadership and the, the people who are cooking food say, of course, we'd be happy to make that for you. But really, when they turn their backs, um, those same uh, leaders or uh, uh, the cooks sometimes are can be heard saying, gosh, why can't these people just eat the same things that everyone else eats? Why do we always have to set up a special table for these people? And so I'm not saying all people think this way, but um, you can imagine in Paul's day that if the weak in faith are the religious Jews who uh, are still keeping Torah and their weakness is tied to their not being convinced who Jesus is yet. They're not fully convinced how the Gentiles fit into the whole program, but they are open to keeping fellowship with Gentiles. They just have their own special dietary needs based on their religious preferences. You can imagine that if the majority are Gentiles, that um, it could foster the same sort of sentiments that Paul's trying to uh, fight against the judgmental attitudes, the 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 looking down your nose at the other person for uh, just not getting on board with the whole program. Um, you know, making uh, people have to go out of their way just to accommodate you, uh, just because you feel that uh, our food is doesn't meet your religious um, strictures or things like that. Um, that's that's kind of what we're talking about. Paul doesn't really want people just to. Um, how do I say it in my commentary? Paul doesn't want the Jews and Gentiles of Rome to just, quote, put up with one another, end quote, merely for the sake of saving face. Understand what I mean? He doesn't want them just, okay, just, you know, you know, this is Paul speaking. Um, this is my, my version of Paul speaking. We know there are people in the congregation who aren't going to eat everything that everyone else eats. Just put up with them, deal with them, you know, accommodate them. Just just turn, turn the other cheek for a while until they can get on the program and become part of the strong and understand that... Um, you know everything's to be received with grace and thanksgiving and 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 everything's clean and you know you don't have to worry about uh, separating what food from what anymore um th- you know that's that's not uh that's i don't believe sorry about that i don't believe that's how paul is uh addressing his letter and writing his letter um so how do i put it in my commentary um i say no a careful study of the overall context of romans chapter 14 with its examples drawn from everyday eating examples of the first century, reveals that what Paul has in mind is a deeper, more foundationally grounded peace that starts from the power of God working in the community of faith to bring about a genuine appreciation for the, quote, unity within diversity, end quote, of Jewish to Gentile, interpersonal relationships and which i say works itself out in sitting down and sharing a meal together with loved ones who are like-minded that's the genuine shalom that paul's working towards i say in my um commentary indeed the truths of this union between israel and the nations that paul is envisioning uh, has been expressed by Paul himself in his letter to the church at Ephesus. So let's pull a quote from the book of Ephesians, and this is going to form a bit of an excursus that I'll pick up next week. I'm not going to do it tonight. Um, I just want to whet your appetite towards uh, this idea. I believe that Paul already knows, when he's writing to the, to the church at Rome, he of course already knows in his spirit 
that the, the union between Jew and Gentile is deeper than just a surface level, hey, can we just all get along? Can we all just put up with one another until we can, until Messiah comes? Can we just, just stop fighting temporarily? I know you guys have your differences. I know you guys don't really like each other, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. But can you at least make it look like you like each other? No. That's not that that's not hunky dory with Paul. That type of like I said, that kind of um, superficiality or surface level, um, you know, shake your hands, shake each other's hands, smile at each other, uh, but uh, you know, deep down in your heart, you're harboring this resentment because the 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 others aren't playing along with the same rules that you are. That's not going to go well with Paul. That doesn't sit too well with Paul. Paul, here's how he expresses the idea of Jew and Gentile brought together as one community under the banner of Messiah, in the book of um, Ephesians. Let's just pick up the uh, quote here. So this entire quote here is from the book of Ephesians. Starting in verse 14 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, we'll read just two verses, three verses, 14, 15, 16. Here's what he has to say, and I made some emphasis in the uh, section. In verse 14, Paul says, For he, speaking of Yeshua, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Who's the us? The us is the Jew and Gentile elements within the scope of Paul's writing. Paul wrote to communities all around the world that um, had similar communal um, social makeups, Jews and Gentiles together. Especially as you've moved farther away from Jerusalem, you're going to have a heavier mix of Gentiles and a lighter mix of Jews. So Paul's aware of this. Remember, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, but he's writing within the scope of helping the Gentile Christians, the brothers, to understand how they have been brought into this family of Abraham. So he says, he, Yeshua, he is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, the hostility between Jew and Gentile. How did he do this? Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Now, of course, your average Christian commentary is going to pick up on verse 15 and say that the way that Jesus um, uh, demolished the wall of hostility, right, tore it down, was by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. And they're going to say, see, here you go. Aha. The way Yeshua brought the Jew and Gentile together was by doing away with the law of Moses. By taking that thing out of the way, we have no more hostility. We have no more enemy towards one another. We've been brought together, made one new man. He destroyed the distinctness between Jew and Gentile and made us just one new humanity. And that's what brings us together. It's not our distinctives of keeping Torah, keeping Sabbath, keeping kosher, um, you know, all that stuff. That's going to keep us separated. Instead, Paul realized that God's going to have to demolish that law because that's the thing that's been separating us for all these years. I'm sorry to say, but that's not the best explanation for this particular verse. I don't have time to go into all of it right now, tonight. I will do my short explanation of it in this excursus, as you can see. Excursus, Ephesians 2.15, Jesus broke down the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. And how are we to understand that? I even made a little video on it, which we'll watch maybe next week or so. But um, suffice to say that there's a better way to understand Paul's verse here. Let me just keep reading this, and this will be kind of like a teaser for next week. But Paul writes it this way. Yeshua abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Notice I have so making peace underlined because this fits in with the theme of let us pursue what makes for peace like you wrote in Romans. And I think some of the similar verbiage shows up even if, even if it might not be the same Greek terminology in the English translation is still the same. So um, it's it's it it um it it complements uh what he wrote in in Romans um 14, 19, like we're looking at. And then in verse 16, Paul says, after saying, so making peace, and might reconcile us both. Who's the us? Keep reminding yourself once again, the us is not just the Gentile Christians when he says reconcile us. Because Paul says reconcile us both. 
from Paul's vantage point, whenever Paul uses phrases like us both or we both or something like that, he's referring to the existing Jewish communities who've been brought into this faith community via their faith in Messiah and the Gentile brothers who are now part of the same community of faith. That's the us. The us is the Jew and Gentile elements of Paul's letters. That's the us. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And uh, that's the end of our quote from Ephesians. If we were to... um, uh, read the quote in its uh, context, which I'm not going to do tonight, um, we would see that uh, Paul is explaining that the Gentiles have been brought into a relationship not just with God, but with Israel as well. And so we'll look at part of that next week. Maybe we'll start by looking at the video or watch the video right in the middle of the, vi- of the uh, teaching next week. But we'll leave off right now for this part of our Roman study right here where it says excursus, Ephesians 2.15, Jesus broke down the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. We'll look at this excursus next week and we'll watch the video and we'll see how this fits into appreciating... <clears throat> Paul's uh, challenge to the Jews and Gentiles there in Rome about uh, pursuing what makes for peace and mutual building, even though we've got Jews and Gentiles who have our differences when it comes to table fellowship, what regards as uh, clean and unclean food, um, what regards as special days and things like that. And that'll do it for uh, Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food, Oh My. Let's turn to exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. Wow, what happened to my page there? There we go. Exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. And um, I did the same thing uh, with the navigation aspect of this uh, commentary that I did with Romans 14. If you go to my commentary now uh, and start scrolling down into it, you'll see that there's a table of contents uh, with clickable links to each of the sections. So, you know, this is a three-paper long, three paper long study, exploring the Shema paper one, God is one. Paper three, uh, paper uh, two of three, uh, Yahweh and Yeshua. And then paper three of three, who or what is the Holy Spirit. And you can see now each uh, paper has its own topics, one through however number, however uh, many numbers, and you can see as I'm scrolling up and down through the section that each one has its own link. So we're in paper three, and who or what is the Holy Spirit, and we're still, we just finished the introduction, my bluff, my bottom line up front. So if I click that, it takes us right down into the section. And, um, uh, um, uh, also, I've got the uh, uh, you know the little sections. As, well, this one doesn't say return to the, to um, return to uh, uh, return to index yet, but um, maybe I'll add that a little bit later. I'll see if I need that or not. But each section has its own mini index, and I think that's probably why I didn't include it because each paper has its own uh, mini index. And so, uh, if you start at paper three at the top, like you know, uh, exploring the Shema paper three, you can see right there. Then um, uh, you can click down through each index topic there. And so we just finished the introduction of my bluff, my bluff, my bottom line up front, where I told you who I think or what I think the Holy Spirit is. We're now ready to turn to section two, paragraph two of uh, paper three. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? Spirit of God versus Spirit of Christ versus the Holy Spirit. So now if I click on the link, it drops me right down into that section of the paper. Uh, and yes, there is a return to table contents. If I click that, it takes me all the way to the very, very top. Uh, and then I can drop down once again into that same section right there. So the links uh, work both ways. All right, so let's pick up our study tonight with this section. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? Spirit of God versus Spirit of Christ versus the Holy Spirit. Are you understanding my illusion there? Why I'm using all three names there. And if you didn't figure it out, you'll figure it out once I start reading through my commentary. All right, here's what I have to say. Most folks who are Trinitarians state that the Holy Spirit is a separate person, while most folks who are non-Trinitarians state that the Holy Spirit is simply God's very own personal spirit, or they admit that the Spirit is an impersonal force of God. So we have differences right away, right at the very beginning, which of course, I'm a Trinitarian, as I'm going to explain here in a second, so I hold to the idea primarily that the Holy Spirit is a separate person of God. He is a person of God. He is the Spirit of God. He is full deity. However, 
as I go on to say in my commentary, I want to admit very early on in the study that as a biblical, messianic Jewish, orthodox with a small o, Trinitarian believer in Yeshua, in my understanding of the scriptures, particularly when examining the Tanakh exclusively, there is indeed room to speak of the Holy Spirit as God's very own personal spirit without the need to conceptualize this spirit as separate and distinct from the very same God in focus at any given time. Are you understanding where I'm trying to um, challenge us with? When we read through the Bible, keep in mind that I believe that God built in progressive revelation in his word so that he reveals himself to his people a little bit of a time over time. He didn't just dump every bit of who he was and what he was doing out all at once to the first person that he met. Instead, he gives uh, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and as the as history unfolds with humanity, and as the pages of Torah get added as the scroll unrolls, in that analogy I used a long time ago, the idea is that God is progressively revealing not just the plans of salvation to humanity, but he's also revealing more and more of who he is and what he is doing among humans. So we get this progressive nature. And so at the early stages of, of interacting with God as humans, we might come to the conclusion that God is a single being and that the Spirit of God and the God who is a spirit are the same being. So we read in the beginning, this is my, the verse I keep picking on, in the beginning uh, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. There isn't any mention of any tripart nature to God's uh, makeup, you know, the ontology of God, uh, in the first verse least that we can see on the surface level. It simply says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And yet, from what we know from reading the apostolic scriptures, we know that Jesus, the Word made flesh, is given creator title. He's given the creator title as well. So that by the time we start reading through Paul, Paul can speak of um, Messiah as the one who created all things by him, for him, and through him, right? You know, the passage out of Colossians, the passage out of Corinthians, uh, locations in the book of Hebrews, and things like that, other places, Romans. We have this idea that Jesus is given the... Um, um, the uh, credit for being the creator. And yet, in Genesis, it doesn't seem to mention Jesus' name. It doesn't even mention the Word. It doesn't say in the beginning, the Word made flesh, created the heavens and the earth. Nothing of the sort. So what we must understand is that there must be some progressive nature to the revelation of how we're understanding God. Otherwise, Paul is spouting off heresy when he says that Jesus is the creator. John is spouting heresy and nonsense when he says the word became flesh and dwelt among men. It's this word that that uh, was with God and was God and through him all things were created. Doesn't John know what Moshe already wrote in Genesis, right? Of course we, I'm just, this is obviously rhetorical questions. Of course, Paul and John understand how Genesis is put together. They understand that God is progressive in his revelation. So, but but it's not wrong to to naturally um, walk away with the idea that perhaps God the Spirit and the Spirit of God are really just one God. There's one person. There's there's not any tripart nature to Him. In other words, I say in my commentary, we often find passages describing God doing such and such, such as the creation, and then other passages describing the Spirit doing such and such. And it's quite natural, I say in my commentary, to arrive at the conclusion that we're only observing one single God in both places. So, for instance, Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's one God. Right? We're reading about the God that we serve, right? Put yourself back in the time of Moses for a moment. Just don't just imagine that John hasn't been written and a Paul hasn't even been born yet. You're way back, this is like thirty five hundred years ago. You're back in the time of Moses, and you're reading what Moses wrote as a, as a basic Israelite. You're reading that Moses wrote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In your mind, would you be picturing this tripart God? Would you be picturing this God who is a being, yet at the same time has a 
a third person of himself that he's going to send to hover over the face of the waters. Verse 2, right? Um, the earth was formed in, in darkness on the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. Are you going to start picturing that the Spirit of God is a separate third person? Or are you going to just think, okay, God is the one who's creating, and the Spirit of God is the one who's hovering Sounds like it's just one God going on. It's probably how you're going to envision uh, reading through the passage. So I say in my commentary, and since God is indeed a spirit himself, right? You're going to learn that sooner or later by reading through your Bible. Then it makes sense that poetic parallelism would make use of describing this God using spirit language in those secondary passages. So, um... In the beginning, God, who is a spirit, created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was on the surface of the deep, and the spirit of this spirit hovered over the surface of the waters. Well, God is a spirit, so the spirit of God must mean the spirit who is God hovered over the surface of the waters. That would kind of be the natural way to read through the Bible and not really do damage to the text. I don't see anything particularly wrong with um, understanding the text if we only had that much information to work with um, per se. All right, so follow along with me. I'm not saying that that's the only way and the final way to understand the passages in question. I am saying that um, given the progressive nature of the way God's revealing himself, we couldn't really fault people that time too harshly for not having a, a more developed uh, ontological aspect of God, right? Um, parts of how God reveals himself to humans is going to be shrouded in mystery uh, until God himself does the revealing. That's just what we're dealing with. Until God reveals himself a certain way, how are we to understand uh, how God is made up of, you know, how he's made up? How he how he can come to us as a human, right? How is he going to uh, become incarnate as a man, right? We just don't have any way of really comprehending that that's the way that God's going to reveal himself. We wouldn't really know, right? History hasn't played that um, part out yet. So I would say in my commentary, we also find passages depicting the Spirit of God, quote, in, quote, empowering individuals as if a, quote, heavenly electricity, in quote, were supercharging their senses and abilities. Thus, I can somewhat understand the non-Trinitarian arguments to a degree. So, non-Trinitarians are fond of saying, you know, God is one person, you know, the Father God and God just is the same person, as Dr. Tuggy would say, God and the Father just are uh, a single identity. There's there's one um, person that we're talking about. There's one uh, being. There's not some tripart breakdown to uh, the God. That you know, God the Father just is the God of Jesus, um, and uh, so He's numerically one. Is the uh, uh, what the the technical way of describing it? He's numerically one, and. Um, so when I listen to their argumentation, when I listen to um, Unitarians or non-Trinitarians, uh, religious Jews, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christadelphians, uh, Iglesia Ni Cristo, um, uh, and other um, non-Trinitarian groups describe their understanding of God, and they use they draw from texts out of the Old Testament, things like that. I can begin to understand how this might be uh, the only way to understand God if that was all we had to deal with if the if there were no apostolic scriptures at all then i could i could really see uh say uh non messianic judaism building a strong case for the fact that there's really only one god and well i mean they they're still going to have to factor in the angel of the lord and the um the shekhinah the glory of god uh the 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 epiphanies um, that we uh, epiphany is that the word? That's not the word I want. The um, where we have God showing up, uh, um, you know, um, in the Old Testament, um, things like that. They're still going to have to factor in how does that work? You know, the Word of the Lord had started to become develop more and more developed as we move closer and closer to the the uh, Common Era. But nevertheless, the point I'm trying to make in this part of my commentary is that I can't be too overly harsh on non-Trinitarians because of the, the progressive revelatory nature of how God reveals himself in the Bible. So, I'm not saying that God 
don't don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that God was numerically one and then suddenly became more than one in the in the New Testament. That's not what I'm saying either. I'm not saying that God changed somehow. He morphed and ontologically he he you know uh, created Jesus and then created the Holy Spirit and so he went from being numerically one to suddenly being numerically three. That's not that's not it at all. What I'm trying to say is that in his complexity, he revealed himself a little bit at a time to we humans. And so the part that we get at any given time sometimes might give us the impression that, that this is all there is to God. If that's all we had, if that's the only experience that we had to work from. Let's keep working through my commentary. I go on to say, yet at the same time, given what has been revealed through the progressive nature of the Bible as a whole, particularly within the apostolic scriptures part of God's word, I believe that we must honestly admit that there's definitely language in this New Testament section of our Bibles that conveys the truth of a spirit being that is described at times using uh, what the Bible says are, what we would recognize are masculine personal pronouns along with personal attributes and character traits that equate him, quote-unquote, the Holy Spirit, with acceptable definitions of personhood, quote-unquote, making it impossible to identify this spirit being as anything other than one of what theologians have come to refer to as one of the persons of the triune Godhead. And you have to remember, God the Father is also a spirit being, whereas comparatively Yeshua the Messiah is a human being. So, we're dealing with a God who in his complexity is on the one hand pure spirit, and on the other hand, if Jesus is full deity, then there's an aspect of God that includes humanity now, a part that was brought into the scope of God's ontological makeup at some point in time, even though that's not the same as saying that Jesus was created. We have one being known as God. This is all very philosophical, right? But we have to we have to try and make sense of what the Bible doesn't give us in, in so many words. Sometimes we have to fill in, kind of read between the lines, um, safely make inferences from what the Bible does give us explicitly and then fill in the rest uh, with our own um, philosophy. Um, which is what I'm doing right now, right? Um, I go on to say, again, God's a spirit and yet the Holy Spirit is a spirit and yet if they're one, if they're two different parts of the Trinity, right, first person and third person, then Yeshua is the odd man out, pun intended, because he's not a spirit. Uh, at least not completely. He's He's got a human body. Now, let, remember I said that um, the Holy Spirit is spoken of using personal pronouns. And this is an important um, observation and an important um, uh, fact that we need to stop and recognize for a second. I have a footnote number 28 where I'm talking about the masculine personal pronouns. Let's take a look at that footnote because it's significant for my study tonight. And I might uh, end off with this um, quote here uh, for our study. Quote number uh, Footnote number 28 in my study here. Here's what I have to say in the footnote. Jesus uses a personal possessive pronoun in the accusative masculine, third person singular, and a demonstrative nominative masculine singular in the Greek of John 16 and 17, I'm sorry, John 16, 7 and 8, respectively. So in 16, 7, he uses a personal possessive pronoun in the accusative masculine, third person singular. And in verse 8, he uses a demonstrative nominative masculine singular. Right? This is where this is the Greek. I'm trying not to get overly technical, but this recognition, this uh um uh, detail is worth highlighting for a moment. The fact that Yeshua speaks of the Spirit using these particular um, uh, aspects to Greek um, is something that even the Jehovah's Witnesses, right, they're a non-Trinitarian quasi-Christian group. Some people would call them a cult. I, I recognize them as a cult as well. But even if you don't call them a cult, um, they're certainly non-Trinitarian. They 
they deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, I say in my commentary, they, they're they forced to translate in their New World Translation, John, uh, the passage, when I say John 16, 7 and 8, they translate verse 7, listen to this, quote, verse 7 of John 16, Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. This is Yeshua speaking in the New World Translation. I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I'm going away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him, emphasis my own, I will send him to you. And then look at verse 8 as they continue. And when that one comes not when he comes, when that one comes, he will give the world convincing evidence concerning sin and concerning righteousness and concerning judgment. End quote. So, this is a quote from John 16, 7 and 8 from the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation, a translation put together by non-Trinitarians, uh, folks who believe that the Holy Spirit is not a person, he does not possess personhood. He's not the third person of the Trinity. They believe that he is an impersonal force of God. And yet, in their own Bible, they translate two sections out of John with personal pronouns. What gives? Now, um, I say in my uh, commentary, um, in their commentary reference to John 16.8, Right. If you pick up a commentary of the, if you pick up a Bible, typically you'll find a commentary tacked onto the side. And if not, you can go online to jw.org and read what I'm about to quote for you. If you read their commentary explanation to John 16:8, they offer this what I call unconvincing explanation. Right. Here's what they have to say. Now, again, um, I don't agree with their theology, uh, but here's how they try to get around it. Here's what they say. Quote. Both that one and he in this verse refer back to the helper mentioned in the preceding verse, which I agree with um, grammatically. That's who the that one and the he is, right? That is who that is. Jesus, they say, used a figure of speech called personification when he spoke of the Holy Spirit and impersonal force as a helper. John 16, 1 through 33, the New World Translation, Study Edition, New World Study Bible, JW.org. JW so, did you catch their, uh, their understanding of why Jesus would call the Holy Spirit a He? It's because, according to their translators and their theology, it's not that Jesus is recognizing that the Holy Spirit truly is a He, but rather, Jesus is using a figure of speech called personification. Okay, I'm not convinced. I think Jesus called the Holy Spirit a he because Jesus understands that the Holy Spirit is a he. But the whole Jehovah's Witnesses are going to say no. So that's what we're left with. <laughs> that's their understanding. So um, that's their perspective about... Uh, um, oops. I didn't mean to jump that far up uh, in my uh, 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 link there. Give me a second. I lost my place in the in in the Bible, or lost my place in my uh, commentary. That's probably a good uh, spot to call it quits um, uh, in this particular section tonight. Maybe that's my uh, cue. Um, who was Holy Spirit? Yeah, yeah. I obviously jumped too far. But um, the point I was trying to make is that. Um, um, Jehovah's Witnesses have to get around what the Greek is actually saying. And in my opinion, if we actually just um, accept what the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Bible is saying, yeah, here it was, I was right there. If we actually just accept what the Bible says at face value and not try to, um, not try to make excuses for what the Bible says, you know, uh, there are other places in the Bible where... And we're going to find this out as we study. We're drawing to a close here. There are other places in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit is given um, personal attributes, such as he can be grieved, he can be lied to, uh, he, can, he has the ability to make decisions on his own and things like that. We're going to find that this doesn't square with the um, non-Trinitarian uh, excuse that, um, and I'm saying excuse there in air quotes, that the Holy Spirit is just being 
personified like the Jehovah's Witnesses would like us to believe. Um, because if he is an impersonal force, how can he be lied to? How does he have his own will in decision-making process? How is it that he can be grieved um, and things like that? How is it that he can even speak, right? Is he like an, uh, uh, what do we say, a, um, an um, artificial intelligence, right? Is he, is he AI or uh, something like that? God forbid. So we're just going to have to keep investigating a bit further, and we're going to keep finding out over and over again that God is mysterious in his makeup. God is unique in his composition, if you want to describe his makeup in terms of composition. He is simply um, beyond our capacity to, to fully comprehend. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, and I'm going to say this uh, in every study, God's revelation to us, no matter how mysterious, is complete, and it is enough of a revelation that we can uh, I'm sorry, we may not be able to fully comprehend it, but we can certainly completely apprehend it and embrace it, even if it is mysterious. And that'll do it for exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. Let's uh, bring, the, bring the study to a close right there. Let's turn to liturgy for tonight. Um, the liturgy, I, uh, since we missed a week, I'm going to rewind, and um, I was going to read the Hebrew and the Greek, uh, but let's go backwards and read the English all over again, and then we'll read the Hebrew and the Greek next week. Leviticus 23, um, verses 1 through 4, is our um, uh, festival liturgy that we've been reading. And last week, or two weeks ago, I read verses related to the uh, uh, festival of um, tabernacles and things like that. Um, or not tabernacles, uh, trumpets. But trumpets is already gone, come and gone, and uh, Yom Kippur is already come and gone, so I'm not going to read those verses. I'll just read verses 1 through 4, which is kind of the generic, uh, general um, introduction to the festivals in this particular part of the Bible. Uh, starting in verse 23, uh, starting in verse 1, I'm sorry, of chapter 23, right here on this side of the page where you can see me highlighted. Um, Moses writes, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak to the people of, let me just go like that, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Verse 3, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. And then Moses comes right back around again and says, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations which shall you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them, which kind of works as a bookend to the uh, first part, even though I know he's going to start introducing Passover, which we're not going to read. And as I mentioned, we're not going to read any Hebrew tonight. We'll save that for next week. Let's turn instead. I will read the passage that I read in 1 Thessalonians, which uh, talks about um, uh, the trumpet, uh, which, in my opinion, is related to um, this time of the year in which it's likely that these festivals are indicating the second return of Messiah. Thus, Christians would probably refer to this time period as the rapture. And um, linked to that monumentous event, which I do believe in the rapture, I just don't know how secretive it's going to be. Um, so you'll have a lot of Messianic teachers say, say that I don't believe in a rapture. I'm like, how can you not believe in a catching up, catching away, where Paul definitely talks about the second coming of Messiah and the resurrection, right? The day of the the the, the, the um the blessed hope that that Paul refers to. Uh, I just don't know how secretive it's going to be, and it, I don't know that it's imminent. Uh, I think those are aspects that uh, Paul probably didn't mean to indicate. Nevertheless, in First Thessalonians chapter four, starting in verse. 15, and we'll read 15, 16, 17, and 18. Um, it is a passage, I believe, that is uh, speaking of um, rapture, resurrection, and he uses language of trumpets, i.e. a shofar or a chazotzara or uh, a salpings in the Greek or something like that, to indicate, we'll just say trumpet in English, since um, that kind of generically captures both shofar and metal trumpet, um, Paul is talking about using this instrument, God using this instrument to awaken uh, those who are asleep in the Lord, right? The um, This resurrection from the dead. Here's how Paul puts it, starting in verse 15 right there on that side of the page. Paul says, 
1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, right, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. If you want to call this the second coming, the rapture, um, the beginning of the day of the Lord, um, whatever you want to call it, please don't say that it's not going to happen. As Messianic believers, we absolutely certainly must be looking forward to this blessed day um, where uh, the Lord is going to return and uh, call us out. Um, and he, how does Paul, Paul describe it? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. So this is a day of resurrection. If you want to call it the rapture, that's fine. If you're uncomfortable with the, using the R word, I can understand. But nevertheless, please don't say it's not going to happen. right? If you're saying that the rapture is not going to happen or that the, the resurrection is not hap going to happen, then um, what are you looking forward to, right? Why did Messiah uh, become the first fruits of those who resurrect from the dead at all? What does Paul say in verse 17? Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them. Who's the them? Those who have been resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So it looks like Yeshua's feet don't need to touch the ground for this to happen. And so we will always be with the Lord. And then he concludes in verse uh, 18 by saying, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What words? These words of uh, the promises that Yeshua is going to return and gather us back to himself. So, um, it's unfortunate that many in Messianic circles, in a, in a um, move to try and distance themselves from uh, the imminent rapture or the secret rapture, are distancing themselves from the resurrection as well. And so um, I, I do hold to a rapture um, uh, concept. I just don't hold to a secret rapture, nor would I hold to an imminent rapture. I think there are precursors to this second coming, uh, this resurrection, and I think there are things that we can look look forward to, some signs that are going to precede it. And uh, I also think it's something that is going to be seen worldwide and won't be secret, like suddenly people vanish, uh, you know, off planet Earth and, and um, everybody else is scratching their heads saying, what happened, right? Kind of like the, you know, the, um, kind of like the uh, Thanos, uh, the Avengers version of the snap, right? Or the, I guess they call it the blip, where he snapped his fingers wearing the Infinity Gauntlet and, you know, half the people disappeared from the cosmos. Uh, is that what's going to happen in the, in, in the uh, rapture, you know? God's going to snap his fingers and, you know, half of people on planet Earth are suddenly going to disappear and the other half are going to be left going, what happened? Not quite. That's not really, that's Hollywood's take on it. That's not really the Bible's take. But we'll look at that a different day. We'll pick up the Hebrew and the Greek next week, but that'll do it for our liturgy for tonight. Let's turn to the uh, the videos um, uh, that we're going to watch. Uh, because of the time that we're running out of, uh, we're getting uh, low on time, I think what I might do is um, only watch one of the videos. I was going to watch two. We'll watch one video, and then as a special treat to my um, uh, live crowd, we'll watch that second video next week. Maybe I'll put it together with the YouTube crowd. Maybe I won't. I'll look at the time. But either way, uh, but then after we watch the video, we'll simply dismiss in prayer. So you ready? Here we go. Short questions, short answers by Torah teacher Ariel and e Bible. Copyright Tete Tor Ministries 2015. All rights reserved. Okay, here's our question for tonight. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? Answer. Most of the details surrounding the Feast of Tabernacles were already covered in uh, the first answer that you would find if you were using ebible.com's website. So I only want to provide some details that I feel were missed or maybe I did not notice them in the first answer. Most of what you're going to be uh, watching tonight by way of this video will show up as bullet points. So you ready? Here we go. Under the main point of historical background, uh, one of four or five main points. Under the historical background, the first point is that the Feast of Tabernacles is one of God's appointed times outlined 
in Leviticus 23 verses 33 through 43. Second point is that this feast along with all the feasts of God are not really quote Jewish end quote in the sense of ownership. That is, the Jews did not invent nor do they own these. They belong to God. Israel was simply the caretakers and proclaimers of the feast. That's why God says you shall proclaim them in their appointed times. The next point is that Tabernacles is one of the three pilgrimage festivals where God commanded all males to appear before him at God's sanctuary, if at all possible. You can reference Exodus 23, 14 through 17. Next point I want you to understand is that no one is allowed to make blood sacrifices anywhere in the world since God's sanctuary is the only allowable location. Read Deuteronomy 12, 4-7 to understand that. Today, as we need to read in our next point, for those of Israel who do not live in the land of Israel and cannot make a trip to Israel, traditionally some build temporary booths, but many do not. They only celebrate the memorial minus sacrifices, etc., since sacrifices are allowable only at the temple. And then the last point under the historical background is that when the apostolic writings refer to these feasts as, quote, of the Jews, end quote, like Leviticus, this phrase simply indicates their association with their cultural attachment to and their historic demonstration of them. It does not imply ownership. Okay, let's keep moving. Next main point is grammatical and spiritual background. First bullet point, the Hebrew word for tabernacle is sukkah, which literally speaks of a tent or a booth. This feast is even sometimes called the Feast of Booths. Next point you need to understand is that this festival receives its name tabernacles or booths because God asked those of Israel who live in the land of Israel to dwell in temporary booths for seven days in commemoration of wandering in the desert. You can read Leviticus 23, 42 and 43 for that reference. Next point, the Messianic application of tabernacles is that it points towards God the eternal word coming to earth in the person of his son Yeshua Jesus and taking up residence in a human vessel. Read John 1.14 where the English word dwell exactly is um, actually the Greek word eskenosin which literally implies pitched a tent. All right, so that's all under the grammatical and spiritual background. Let's move to two points under future prophecies. Point number one, since the Lord Yeshua literally fulfilled the first four of the seven feasts at his first coming, it is my belief that he will likewise fulfill the final three in like fashion. And the second point, we also know that God will mandate worldwide keeping of this feast during the millennium if you read Zechariah 14, 16 through 18 and take it on a literal level. Let's move to a uh, topic of practical application and relevance for Christians. Uh, I want you to be able to follow this particular biblical logic. Okay, there's about one, two, three, four, five or so bullet points under this topic of practical application. Here we go. First point, they belong to God. Leviticus 23, 1 through 3, as well as Leviticus 23, 44. They're God's feasts. Point two, when the temple still stood, tabernacles was kept with sacrifices and such. Now that there's no temple, the keeping of this feast has become primarily a memorial, like communion is a memorial, but many still build booths to stay in throughout the seven days. Point three, broadly speaking, God commissioned only Israel, not the world, to proclaim them as the Lord's feasts. In other words, the verse says, quote, speak to the people of Israel, etc., end quote. All right, understand? Uh, next point, in Christ, Gentile Christians are no longer alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. This is an extremely important point that we can read about in Ephesians 2.12. Gentile Christians have been brought into the commonwealth of Israel and become part of the remnant of Israel. Thus, the scriptures of Israel, the instructions of Israel, now become um, a part of the instructions that are given to Gentile Christians, which leads me to my uh, last bullet point in this practical application relevance for Christians, is that in Christ, Gentile Christians have now become fellow heirs with the saints and members of the household of God, which at the time historically that uh, Paul wrote this in Ephesians 2.19, the uh, household of God primarily uh, focused on natural born sons of Jacob, i.e. Uh, native born Israelites. Okay, so what are our conclusions to tonight's study? 
Our conclusions are this. For Gentile Christians, these seats are yours to keep if you desire to just as much as any Messianic Jew. Read Colossians 2, 16 and 17, which I believe we're going to study next week. So keep watching my YouTube videos and listening to my iTunes podcast, and we'll hit Colossians 2, 16 and 17 next week, I believe. Not to become saved or out of legalism when you're keeping these feasts, or to earn brownie points with God, as if these were possible. But the reason you want to keep these feasts is if you wish to keep them out of love for God and His Messiah. Make sense? Omain? Omain. Check out my podcasts, which are available on iTunes. You can search for me in the store under the search term Ariel Hanavi. But if you prefer to watch your theology, check out my YouTube channel, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and click the bell for notifications. New content is added weekly or even daily. And that'll do it for the video for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name. I thank you for the study. I thank you for the truths of what we can glean by studying your words of life, by pouring through the scriptures with a heart open to receive what the spirit of life is revealing to us about the Messiah, about uh, the God that we serve, about the communities that we're involved in. Um, helping us to make practical application from 2,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, trying to bring it into a place where it's relevant for us today as people of God. Um, For instance, we can't keep the festivals the way they did in the Bible. We don't have any sacrifices to bring. We don't have any animals to slaughter. We can't visit the temple if we don't live in Israel and things like that. But even though those elements are removed, Lord, we can still walk into your festivals. We can keep the memorial aspects. We can become obedient to your words with what we've been left with. We can still meet together. We can gather together. We can pray for one another. We can celebrate your goodness and mercy. We can sing. We can dance. We can shout. We can blow shofars. We can fall on our faces in repentance on the day of of, uh, uh, Yom Kippur and Atonement. We can build our tabernacles, our booths, our sukkahs, and um, picture dwelling with Papa. Uh, Thank you, Lord, that all of these things are available to us, and we can do these things, and these things we will do by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together and continuing to protect us and raise us up, giving us a voice, giving us opportunity to share our testimony with those around us, helping us to continue to hold on to that blessed hope, which is the the second coming of our Messiah, Yeshua, like we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4. Help us, Lord, not to lose sight of the fact that even though the world seems to be spinning out of control all around us with all of the, the political nonsense, the racial tension, the um uh, the the pandemic and and all of the other things that 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 just present a challenge to everyday living lord help us not lose sight of the fact that you have a, a plan and your plans cannot be thwarted and so you're a god who is in control and you're a father who cares you're not just uh you know wringing your hands up at him and saying oh well i wish i could do something about your plight. I wish I could help you guys out down there on planet Earth, but you know, there's nothing I can do. No, that's not the God that we serve. Um, We know that you are are, um, um, helping us and you're equipping us and you're empowering us to lead lives that are holy and pleasing to you. And so we'll continue to press into your holiness as difficult as it is. Lord, continue to protect us and raise us up and go with us this week as a people of God. and Bring us back together once again next week, if it be your will. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. Bashim Yeshua. Amen. That concludes our show for today. It is my desire that this continuing series of teachings will assist the average non-Jewish believer or new Messianic Jewish believer in his desire to become a more mature child of God. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today. 
for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, it is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song were written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For more information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com. 